Which is this? Sriracha sauce. <laughs> Committed, committed to respond to the call of a wounded world, we join together this day with loving hearts, hands, and minds, embracing the interconnected web of water, air, and earth. We light a fire of sustaining hope, ever bright with love and justice. May we bring forth this day new wisdom, strength, and courage to create a new world, a new world not of wealth, but well-being, a world of new peace and abundance for all. As we give thanks for this earth, our shared and singular home, may we dedicate ourselves to its ongoing care, rising to the calls deep within us and all around us. May we respond today and always with courage and with love. At this time, we have an opportunity to light our candles of community at the table in the back, you can light a candle for a joy or a concern or simply to bring more light into our space. stand together in body or spirit for our chalice lighting, our spoken reformation, and our lighting of the peace candle. Lighting this chalice may feel difficult today, this symbol of justice known to be a light of hope for the marginalized, a message of sanctuary for the oppressed, a flame that feels lost or diminished somehow. How do we rekindle this fire of compassion? How do we rekindle this fire of mercy? A famous verse within the Quran tells us that with hardship comes ease. With hardship comes ease. We welcome the ease, O God of justice. We welcome the ease, O spirit of love. We welcome the ease and rekindle this flame. From our tears, our quiet suffering, from our collective prayers for those who cry for freedom, we welcome the ease and rekindle this flame. On behalf of those who feel abandoned and betrayed, we welcome the ease and rekindle this flame. For all of the children who ask, why can we not live in peace as other children do, may lighting this chalice today, no matter how difficult it may feel, Help us to rekindle compassion and mercy 
within the deep crevices of our hearts so that we can once again bring justice and hope to a world struggling to find its humanity, struggling to find its soul. Let us join together in the spoken affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom, and to help one another. Hear our universal prayer for peace. Lead me from death to life, from falsehood to truth. Lead me from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead me from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace. We light this peace candle to remind us of all the places in the world where there is no peace. May be seated. <clears throat> Our opening thought comes to us from John Lewis in his book, Carry On, Reflections for a New Generation. When you see something that is not the way it should be, don't be afraid. Speak up. Speak out. Be courageous. It's a total commitment. No compromise. Just go for it. Our next reading comes from The Dance of Fear, Rising Above Anxiety, Fear, and Shame to Be Your Best and Bravest Self, 
by Harriet Lerner. If you pay attention, you may find that it is not fear that stops you from doing the brave and true thing in your daily life. Rather, the problem is avoidance. You want to feel comfortable, so you avoid doing the thing that will evoke fear and other disquieting emotions. Avoidance will make you feel less vulnerable in the short run, but it will never make you less afraid. Let's join together in our time of meditation. I'll be reading from words from Dorothy Day, from a meditation on Dorothy Day called Crying Out for Justice. Let's find a comfortable way of sitting and put both of our legs on the ground, centering ourselves and breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in. and out. We must cry out against injustice or by our silence consent to it. If we keep silent, the very stones of the street will cry out. We can do much to change the face of the earth. In that, I have hope and faith. But these pains and sufferings are the price we have to pay. Can we change persons in a night or a day? Can we give them as much as three months or even a year? A child is forming in the mother's womb for nine long months, and it seems so long. But to make a person in the time of our present disorder with all the world convulsed and hatred and strife and selfish, that is a lifetime's work. And then too often it is not accomplished. Even the best of human love is filled with self-seeking. To work to increase love for each other, this is a lifetime job. We are never going to be finished. Love and ever more love is the only solution to every problem that comes up. If we have love for each other enough, we will bear each other's faults and burdens. If we love enough, we are going to light that fire in the hearts of others. And it is love that will burn out the sins and hatreds that sadden us. It is love that will make us want to do great things for each other. No sacrifice and no suffering will then seem too much.
Our next reading comes to us from Michael Sandel from his book, Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do? He writes, to achieve a just society, we have to reason together about the meaning of the good life and to create a public culture hospitable to the disagreements that will inevitably arise. We're living through a time which is not dissimilar from many other times in history, unfortunately, of great divisions, many wars and strife, and a lot of polarization within our society. And it sometimes seems difficult, even risky, to speak up during such times, to speak up for our understanding of justice, to speak against injustice, to speak out for those who are vulnerable in times like these. So today I'm reflecting on the question, how can we speak for justice while also cultivating beloved community? How can we speak up when it's not easy to speak up. Growing up, I was often told by family and friends that there are two things that you should never talk about, religion and politics. <laughs> and so what did I do? I went and studied religious studies and, and then did a PhD in social ethics, which has a lot to do with politics. And trust me, if you're ever traveling uh, in mass transportation or on a plane and someone starts asking you questions and you tell them that you're both a minister uh, and a professor of social ethics, the questions come <laughs> and it's almost difficult to avoid speaking about religion and politics in those situations. It, because, you know, we avoid it because it's uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to say things that will be taken the wrong way by others. We don't want to say things that will perhaps make people think less of us if they have a disagreement with us. We want people to like us. We want everyone just to be able to get along. So there are times when it's really difficult for us to speak out because it makes us uncomfortable. But often those times when, it's make, when it makes us the most uncomfortable, those are the times that we most need to be speaking out. 
when attempts are being made, for example, to silence dissent, which we see in our culture today, that's not something new, but we see it, it being very prevalent today, it is precisely a time like this when voices of dissent are most needed. It's precisely a time like this when it's uncomfortable to speak up that it's most important for us to speak up, to speak out against injustices in our society. When states are passing anti-woke laws, whitewashing history, and devaluing the lives and experiences of persons who are LGBTQ2S+, this is precisely the time when silence, especially silence from allies, is unacceptable. We are witnessing in the world today that one of the most effective ways to turn a democratic republic into an autocratic state is to appeal to religious nationalism. To appeal to religious nationalism and the concomitant beliefs that the promotion of one's religion is more important than the values and the ideals of participatory democracy. Appeals to religious nationalism are even more effective when religious interests end up corresponding with the ethno-cultural interests of a large percentage of persons living in our society. That's why it's not an accident that so many autocrats in the world and so many autocrat wannabes in the world, like Putin, Modi, Trump, Orban, Bolsonaro, Le Pen, Maloney, and Netanyahu and others, appeal to religious nationalism to garner support in order to gain and maintain and even expand their power. It's the moral responsibility of all religious leaders to relentlessly speak out against and resist this manipulation, this misuse of religion. White moderates. Martin Luther King Jr. had a few things to say about white moderates in his letter from the Birmingham jail. White moderates are still too hesitant to speak up and speak out against systemic injustice within our society. Perhaps this is because they are in many ways beneficiaries of its continuation. White Christian nationalism in the United States would have far less power if white moderates were not complicit through their relative silence in the face of such religious distortion for the perpetuation of white supremacy. Part of being a mature and responsible person, something that we're all struggling to do all the time, <laughs> part of being a mature and responsible person is learning to be okay with persons not liking us. Learning to be okay with persons working against us when we speak out against systemic injustice. Keep in mind that MLK had a 75% disapproval rating in the last year of his life. <clears throat> Most people don't realize that, a 75% disapproval rating in the last year of his life because, not only because of this, but a lot of it was because of this, in 1967 at Riverside Church in New York City, right across from Union Theological Seminary, he spoke out against the war in Vietnam. It's not possible to create positive social change without some sacrifice and without willing to experience some social rejection 
and sometimes even suffering. Not everyone is going to like us. Not everyone is going to approve of us all of the time, and especially when we speak out against injustice. But the only way to build the critical mass of persons that's needed to transform systemic justices in our society is for persons to speak out when it's not easy to speak out. Thus, making it easier for more and more persons to speak out and to participate in the work for social change. But there has to be some courageous few that will speak out when it's not easy, that will speak out when it's not comfortable to do so, so that others might find it easier to do so in the future. It was not easy in a country built on genocide and the dehumanizing institution of slavery for the first abolitionists to speak out against and resist the systemic injustice of slavery. But the freedom of millions of persons depended on it. <clears throat> Families separated over this. There were my own ancestors. I look back on some of my ancestors. Cassius Marcellus Clay was one of my ancestors. Uh, he was an abolitionist in uh, Kentucky. His family rejected him over that. It was not easy for suffragists and feminists to speak out against and resist the perpetuation of patriarchal power in politics and society. But the movement towards gender equality depended on it. It was not easy to speak out and resist uh, the Jim Crow laws and the segregation that were a part of the Jim Crow laws, but the movement towards civil rights and racial justice depended on it. It was not easy to speak out against and resist the homophobia and transphobia that has existed for so long in churches and society, but the movement towards equality of all depended on it. It was not easy to speak out against and resist the power of fossil fuel companies as they hurl us towards an unlivable climate hurl us towards climate chaos, but climate justice and a livable climate for all depend on it. It's not easy to speak out against and resist the false white and patriarchal gospel of white Christian nationalism, voter suppression, <clears throat> and the patriarchal control over women's bodies, but a non-patriarchal participatory and multicultural democracy depends on it. Religious communities that respect truth and freedom and that value all persons equally will work to make it easier for persons to speak out against and resist all systemic injustices within our society, even if we may not always agree on exactly what that means or about how it ought to be accomplished. Our religious communities ought to be a space where we encourage each other to speak out when it's uncomfortable to do so, to speak out against injustices when it's not easy to do so. When members of our community take the risk of speaking out against injustice, they need our support. And when it's possible, they need us to join them to create a chorus of voices against injustice in our world. The only viable path toward beloved community depends on it. <clears throat> Last week, I shared with you the journey that we took in the United Methodist Church towards a more inclusive church at our last general conference in April of 2024. It was a wonderful experience. It was a wonderful development to take out the harmful language from our book of discipline, 
to take away the bans against uh, marriage equality and persons who are LGBTQ becoming ordained ministers in the United Methodist Church. And it passed overwhelmingly, as I told you last week. But it wasn't always that way. In the 1970s, in the United Methodist Church, it was not easy to speak out for the rights of persons who are LGBTQ. In the 1980s, it was not easy. Persons lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods for speaking out. Persons who were ordained were, quote, defrocked for speaking out. In the 1990s, it became a situation of even greater restrictions, even greater punishments for those who spoke out. I remember in 1995, I signed a statement of commitment for the full inclusion and participation of persons who are LGBTQ in the life and ministry of the church. Only seven clergy in Oklahoma signed that document. It was not easy to speak out in 1995 in the United Methodist Church, but that was precisely the time that people needed to speak out. And now that we've seen this really incredible journey come to a new day, not a completed day, there's much more that needs to be done, I think it's really important not to forget those who spoke out, those who resisted when it was not easy to do so. That they not be forgotten. That they be remembered. That they be restored as much as possible. And also that reparations be paid to them in some way for the great harm that was done against them. Because they were the ones who spoke out and resisted when it was most difficult to do so. They were the ones that sacrificed and suffered the most harm for speaking out and resisting. That's the way it is with any movement for social change. There's going to be those times when it's difficult and risky and might even mean sacrifice and suffering when speaking out. But it's precisely those times that we must try to muster the courage to do so, because if we don't speak out, who will? Mm -hmm. If we don't speak out, who will? May this be the kind of beloved community which supports those who speak out, which supports those who resist the injustices in the world. The future of our beloved community depends on it. At this time, we have an opportunity for giving, uh, and you can bring your gifts to the table. There's also opportunities to give online.
Let us stand together in body or spirit for our parting thought and extinguishing the chalice. Our parting thought comes from Desmond Tutu, as quoted by Robert McAfee Brown in Unexpected News. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Let us join in extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.